and that's a strange thing in war. It is such a desolate feeling if you happen to get trapped out by yourself somewhere and you're being shot at and there's nobody there to, to help you. As a, matter, as a matter of fact, I openly said, Mother, please help me. That's how bad it was. Yeah. It's, uh, there's, there's days yet that I, I don't want to have any connection with humans at all. I had nothing to do with them. I have certain places where we live now, and I had places where we lived before, that if I want to get away from it, I could go to those places in the woods and I could put my hands up and scream as hard as I could scream to try and get this devil off of my back. An epic thing is happening amid the crumbling and burning walls of the compact town above the surly green waves of the Adriatic. Western Canadian troops got into the outskirts today. Can you tell me about Ortona? Oh, Ortona, yeah. Ortona is only a town on the east coast of Italy of no particular importance. And they're never quite sure why the Germans decided to make a stance there, but they did. The Ortona troops were a bit cocky and said, as they went in, we'll have Ortona for you in the morning. They got the shock of their lives. They didn't realize the kind of troops that the Germans had in there. They had their best airborne troops in against us. And I don't think there was one of those buggers uh, under six foot tall. They had the great big leather boots up to here. They were, they were vicious. They, they weren't human. Our fine troops found themselves facing a parachute division, a formation of savage, cunning young zealots, as good as anything the warrior Germans ever produced. We were a false army. We must go there where we were an elite troop. We were feared. We were from the Alliierten feared. Wirklich war als grüne Teufel genannt, ne? Ich weiß nicht, ob Sie das wissen. Wir waren, wir waren, wir waren die beste, die besten Soldaten der Welt, waren die falsche Mehl. Well, day one was to get from this side of the street over to that side. For what reason, I don't know why we had to get from here to there, because to me it all looked the same going up, houses on both sides. Das hatten wir vorher, wir wussten, dass die Kanadier kommen und wir wussten auch, dass wir Ortona nicht halten können. Und da haben wir auch, um, den, um die Kanadier in schwere Kämpfe einzuwickeln, haben wir den Marktplatz mit Maschinengewehren, mit SMG, MG 42 bestickt und haben auf die, auf die Kanadier gewartet. The town of Ortona was piles of rubble. The Germans had blown a lot of houses down and the streets were literally full of rubble. They'd done this deliberately. They'd blow houses down on both sides to fill the, the street full of rubble. They'd set their machine gun up on top of that, and they're looking down on you, and they, if you get out in the, in the open, you're dead. And now in Ortona, the action is as fierce, perhaps, as modern man has ever fought. Western Canadian troops and tanks are fighting a vicious street battle against Germans who can test every window and every yard with cunning skill and desperate courage. You couldn't stick your head out in the open. They'd, they had you covered. That's why we ended up mouse-holing. Well, mouse-holing, most of those houses were all joined together. And uh, with the butts of our rifles, 
we would bang and bang on the walls till you opened a hole, and then we just toss the grenade in. Man kann sich das gar nicht so erklären, wie schnell das geht. Ruckzuck. Manche sind aus dem Fenster rausgesprungen, was auf halber Höhe war, um bloß nicht erschossen zu werden. Und dann sind manche wieder aus dem Fenster gesprungen, weil unten die Kanadier ausreißen wollten. Sometimes, when possible, we'd use the anti-tank gun and blow a big hole in and then just go from room to room. You know, then just somebody else would come along and clean up the bodies and you just keep on going. You know, you see a guy all bleeding and wounded and, and shot up or his guts hanging out. You just forgot about fear or, or stress or anything. You just went out and, and you tried to go and save him. This, this is what I, that's what I joined up for, and this is uh, what, what we done. In the command post, Captain Vic Soli of Edmonton said something that sent a thrill down my spine. He pointed at two lightly wounded men and said, those two men and several other wounded have disobeyed orders. They refuse to evacuate. They don't argue, they refuse. One of them said, sir, we are going to see this thing through to the end. In the town of Artona, let's say, first day you lose 30 men, they're replaced, you're still standing there. The next day or that next night you lose 20 or 30 or however many, you're still standing there. I'd done this for 23 months. So you can imagine how I felt. You know, your luck just keeps running out and running out and you're, you're down to the last, last breath of air and you're still standing. And I would like an answer to that. Like Stalingrad, and through the same apocalyptic pall of smoke and fire and maniacal determination, the battle has this quality of nightmare, and the rattling hurricane of the machine guns never stops. Nobody could move. It was one of Hitler's last stands in Italy. He told his troops that you fight until the end. You, I know you just keep wondering, in the name of God, is this ever going to stop? You know, when will it stop? It was one of the, the most fiercest battles you've ever seen. One of our boys was, his leg was shot up real bad, just hanging there. So I run over and I try to get a, a field dressing on him, and I mean, tearing away at his pants and whatnot, and Dr. Granger come over and says, Rudy, Rudy, quickly get your, your, your jackknife out. I got it out, and I thought he meant to cut the rest of his pants away so we could get out of his wounds. Oh, he said, cut, his, cut the rest of his leg off. It was horrible. The square was the killing ground. In the morning, when we stepped out, the sergeant told us, step out and have a look, but don't go too far. But when we did get out and looked, what I saw was a dead German lying there with, with no head. And right beside him was a big donkey. It was puffed up ever so big. But that head thing bothers me because it wasn't there. And I, I seem to dream that I wonder what he looked like. I, I don't know what happened to the head, I don't know. And that still, to this day, sticks in my brain. It was a maelstrom of noise and hot, splitting steel. Perhaps 30 or 40 Canadian-German machine guns were burping at once, but it sounded like hundreds. If it wasn't hell, it was the courtyard of hell. 
das muss man mitmachen, um das, das, sonst kann man das gar nicht so, so menschlich erklären. Also das, das ist fast unmöglich. Man muss das mitmachen und erlebt haben, wie das ist, wenn ein der Tod im Nacken sitzt. Da haben sie unheimliche Kräfte. Sie entwickeln einen Mut. An Tod denken sie gar nicht. Sie wollen nur äh, weg, weg, weg oder... I remember for this one incident, a German machine gun setting up on this, one of the higher mounds of rubble in the street. And the machine gunner was just a kid. And he'd got hit in the face and his eyeballs were hanging on his cheeks. Corporal Squire, he can speak German. He hollered for him to give up. He says, come and get me. And just took the machine gun like that until he ran out of ammunition. That's what they were like. He was about 17 years old. Did you did you shoot him? Or? Yeah, no, I didn't. But yeah, he was he was shot. Because even though he's blind, he's still pouring the lead at you. Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians. All on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. You know, it, it was a terrible feeling to, to see people die. I know I put many of the Germans away with with morphine. We, we used to bring them, we bring them in that was, German prisoners that were wounded, they were shot through the lungs. And I remember Fairfield and Dr. Granger and both Dr. Anderson, they they say, well, we can't help them, so just give them a couple of shots of morphine and go and bury them. And, and we've we done that. And I, I know I've buried uh, some Germans that they weren't even dead yet. We just threw them in a, dug a little bit of a grave and threw some ground over them. They weren't even dead? Well, I, I, well, you have to give them a couple of shots of morphine. You know, and they, they're out. You don't know whether they're dead or not, but we, they're going to die anyway with, uh, you know, with, with, with lung shots. Uh, did it, did it disturb you? Oh yes, yes, it, it did disturb. I, I still get nightmares over it. I, this is why I haven't talked about it for years and years. I'm, I was trying to, you know, to to avoid to have these memories come back. It is Christmas Eve. There is still the hardest of fighting in the streets of Ortona. Each day, we thought the bloody combat would become less intense. Each day, it became more intense. The enemy would not break. Ortona was just, just about blown to rubble. On the 24th of December, the Germans blew up uh, uh, St. Thomas Cathedral. Uh, there was there was hundreds of Italians hiding, taking shelter there. They drove them out onto the streets before they blew it up. There was no Christmas truce there at all. Christmas Day. I am speaking now from this Canadian field dressing station, not many miles behind the front where Canada is fighting one of the greatest battles of our history on Christmas Day. Just near me are some Canadian soldiers in the ward who are going to sing carols for the benefit of the wounded. They're just starting to sing. And the, the one interesting part that I found amazing is that General Volks, who was commanding one div, decided that his people were going to have Christmas lunch, war or no war. And we had captured a big church on our way into Ortona, and he, he brought all his, his cooks and his kitchens up there, and he made Kiss Christmas lunch.
The Christmas dinner, it started 11 o'clock, December the 25th. They, they held in a little church. They called one company in at a time, and they'd have dinner, and, uh, and the pipe major, Essen, would, would blow the bagpipes, and they'd have the organ playing, and they'd be having carols and whatnot, and they'd have a great dinner, all, all the food you could eat. I don't know how they brought it up. They must have come as far as they could with a Jeep, and then they carried it in containers. It was, it was warm, and I'm not sure if it was beef or, or pork, but it was warm. Meat and gravy and, and potatoes and one bottle of beer. Was the Christmas dinner within range of the oh, German guns? Oh, yes, yes. You, you still, they were still, the German guns were, the, the shells were still uh, breaking all, all around. The Germans with their 88 guns were still lobbing the, their shells in, into Artona, yes. I never took part of it because we were too busy picking up the wounded. Were your thoughts about Christmas that day? No. I thought about staying alive. I realized it was Christmas Day, and I suppose for this film, I might as well add, I actually shot a German on Christmas Day. And uh, at the time, he, it was just another day, and he was just another enemy. Was he down on the square? He was down on the st stair square coming towards the building that I was in. You kill him? I don't know. He dropped, and uh, two guys ran out and dragged him back, and, and I held my fire. And you know, uh, at that time, you know, I was just doing my job. It was just another day, but uh, I, I kind of hate to talk about it now. Why? It was Christmas, you know. I, I, thinking about it now, you know, I, I should have taken my chances and let him go because, you know, it just bothers me because it was, I'd killed somebody on Christmas Day or wounded somebody. I don't know if he was wounded or killed. I have no idea, but uh, just the thought of me doing that is kind of upsetting. Uh, very upsetting, as a matter of fact, but uh, uh, when I talk to the kids sometimes, they cry still. So. At 8 o'clock this morning, there was a strange silence. The colonel grinned when I came in. I said, don't tell me. And he replied, yes, I think we've got Ortona. We must then give up, because the overmacht was too big. And it was was vorbei, ne? Was Ortona gefallen. Then im Ende Dezember sind wir alle ab. Da haben wir Ortona aufgegeben. Dann war es aus. Everything was dead silent. What a feeling. To hear that nothing. Just dead silent. It's hard to... Uh, for you to gather all these thoughts, all of a sudden, you know, everything just comes to a standstill. It, it was a pleasant feeling. What a relief. You know, everybody is, is uh, tired, and you've been going straight for eight days, day and night. I don't know where the people that lived in Nortona, I have no idea where they went. But I know that the day that they pulled out of there, German pulled out, that uh, they were coming in from the caves that they had dug in. And I always remember one woman uh, carrying a little baby, just born, I presume, into a piece of burlap carrying it over this cave and they were all asking for food and we, we never had food to give them so 
So they suffer too, the population, the poor. the bell of its cathedral, the cathedral of St. Thomas the Apostle told. For the Canadians who died in taking the town, for the Germans who fell defending it, and for the dust and ashes of the cathedral itself, the bell told. For the living as well, the bell told, calling them to prayer. I have nights where I, I dream that I go back to our town and saw this German going with his long winter coat on. There's three guys. They tried to get me, but they haven't got me yet. You could see the flames shooting out of some of the tanks that had been already hit. And if you couldn't actually see the tanks, you could see the smoke uh, going up in the air. It was a scary scene to hear those tanks blowing up and the flames shooting up in the air, sparks flying out of them. It was pretty, pretty awesome. You go up in these tanks have been knocked out, burned. The tanks are still hot and warm and smelly and smell the flesh and everything else. And you've got to get inside the tanks and they get these clumps of mass of blood and uh, uniforms and stuff like that and hand these bodies out that to be identified and buried and uh, or gets, that's a horrible bloody job. Which place is a good place to die? Definitely not a tank. It was not tank country. Italy is, is in the shape of, a, shape of a shoe, and there are mountains running right down the middle. Every three or four miles was another river that we had to fight our way over. Very, very rough, bad country for tanks. We found canals, we found ditches, we found vines, we found rivers. Never did we find tank country. This is Peter Strasberg of the CBC reporting from the Italian front. After the Canadian Corps broke through the Adolf Hitler line and the firm base was established, the regiment was ordered to drive through, seize and hold the crossings of the Melfa River to keep to the situation. Before we were all ready to go, I was sitting in the, in the turret, open a can of bully beef and, and have breakfast and wash it down with rum because I always had a lot of rum around. And I would be scared. I knew it was coming, and I knew I might be dead. I knew my tank might go. And I would try to tell funny stories over the microphone to my men. Even if they weren't funny, they'd laugh because they were uh, as uptight as I was. We were Sherman tanks. It's an American tank, weighs 31 tons. Not nearly armored as well as the German Panthers or Grenadiers. Our shells would just, uh, armor piercing shells would just bounce off a, a Panther attack. But we move quickly. Fighting a tank is complicated. There's no one tank man, there's five tank men. And they've got to work together. And they've got to learn to do it and they've got to live together. And they become almost like brothers, they have to. I would say we were quite close, but they also kept changing too. I've had a lot of them die. We went into action Oh, about 6 o'clock in the morning. 
sun was, you know, this was uh, May, the sun was up early. And we started to head for the next river, which the, which the Germans were behind, as always. When we got to the Amelfa, we were pinned down. And so Lieutenant Ed Perkins took his tanks across the Melf River. And he got into a position where were heavily outnumbered by German troops and, and German uh, big tanks, the Panthers and the uh, Tigers. And uh, he was wounded, I think, twice. Uh, the, twice the colonel told him to evacuate, and he said, no, I'm staying. We're now on the north bank of the Melfa, and our tanks are in a hold-down position. There was a considerable amount of tank fire. In the meantime, Perkins is going back and forth, up and down the bank, and no doubt he's looking for places that he can put the Westminsters when they arrive. Uh, unfortunately, the Westminsters didn't arrive until two hours after we got there. Two hours. So Perkins thought, and it was a good idea, that we uh, should fire off all of our ammunition that we had. Let the Germans be of the impression that we had a strong force. So we'd fire Piet, 5-0 machine gun, and Bren guns, uh, the three olds, anything, and fire them out in front of the German tanks and in infantry to have them think that, man, those guys are some, are some force. And it worked. At least I guess it worked, because we're still, some of us are still here. The night of the Melf River and the next morning, in total, we lost 25 guys in 24 hours. Perkins and his crew established a bridgehead across the river that enabled us to break the line and go forward. Bud McLean was part of the group with Perkins that grabbed and held the side of the river, which uh, they both won, Captain Perkins won a, a medal, and so did Bud McLean, the MM, for holding that position. But our worst part of the Melfort River was that following day. There was a good deal of haze between the Melfort and the Leary from the smoke of battle, but I could make out some movement on the road. Spread over the green countryside were Canadian tanks, and some were moving forward as there were handkerchiefs of dust clinging to them. May 24th was the day of the Melfort River. We pulled back May 25th. We were not seasoned veterans. We all pulled our tanks back and parked them near each other and jumped out of the tanks to see who was hit and who was alive and so forth. And unbeknown to us, there was a German with a radio not far away and brought the Nebelwerfers, as they were called, and brought them right down on our tanks. So well, they found me in a field. I got out of, I'd gotten out of the tank, evidently, and uh, was wandering around. I can't remember exactly what happened. I was in a field somewhere, and the tanks were burning up. We lost 26 men. I'm the only one alive from my troop. The tanks brewed up.
they call for stretcher bearers and you have to go out there, whether they're, the shells are bursting or the, or the bullets are flying, that this is their job. And, and there was very few of us that could do it. A lot of the other boys, when the firing and the shells were firing, they, would, they wouldn't dare go out. I volunteered many a times to do different things where other boys wouldn't go. And when we pulled people out of the tanks, we'd, we'd grab a hold of their arm or, or their head would come off, they would cook like a turkey. A German came up and he fired. And fortunately for me, it was over 45 degrees, and they need to be almost at 90 degrees to penetrate. And it bounced off the tank. And I can tell you, my heart was was up in my throat, but it, it bounced off the tank. If it didn't, it, it would be it would create a brew up. And unfortunately, some of my tanks did brew up. Everybody dies usually. They call it a brew up. That's a, an army expression. That means it catches fire, explodes, and goes up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would be an awful, way to, an awful way to die, uh, to, to be burned up. Yeah. We took one of my friends out in a shoebox. A third of our tanks were lost in that one day, and a third of our officers. That was worse for us in casualties than the actual action at the Melfa itself. Those two in a solid bed of armor met the best of the German armor, the famous Panther tank. And although knowing themselves outgunned, the other two commanders shot his duty many times to avoid the German fight and their battery up. The Germans were re retreating at this point. Yeah, we put them on the run. We were advancing in all this line. There's not just the Strathconas, but there are other regiments, and the, the Perth Regiment, and the Irish, and the various infantry, Cape Breton Highlanders. They were all coming in line after us. The tanks went in there first. You were trying to go forward, basically, to kill the Germans. And you saw them, you started to kill them. I was much too busy to be scared, and I wanted to do what I came to do in the first place, which was to beat the Germans. We shot the first Tiger tank in Italy. And if you shoot it head on, you can't, you can't penetrate it. Uh, the only way is from the back, or we knocked the tread off which is, has to be a good lucky shot. And the first Tiger, we knocked the tread off, and the uh, crews of the Tiger tank evacuated. And we shot with machine guns on them. It was a, a feeling of elation. Yeah, we got them. We never, to my knowledge, ever killed a prisoner, ever. But we could refuse to take prisoners, which is what they were doing. And in one case, I overran a position, and the people jumped out and dropped their, their rifles and stuck their hands in the air and started to scream, camarade, camarade. And I refused to accept their, their surrender. I just turned my, my gunner loose on them and wiped them out. After the Hitler line, three days after, we were still picking up. We had our wounded picked, we were, so we were loading the dead on a flat car, uh, on a flat box of a, of a truck. And our sergeant picked up his own son. He didn't know he was in the army. He absolutely went berserk, I'm telling you. There were so many dead and, and uh, Germans and, and our boys and everything else, 
that they had to push them out of the side for our, our artillery and our tanks to come through. And after three days, we didn't have our, 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 our dead picked up. So the bulldozers came in and dug big holes and just pushed everybody in. So they, they were both German and Canadian dead? Both German, Canadian, and there was animals and everything else. The Melfer River was the great breakthrough that sort of paved the route to Rome. The road to Rome was lined with the wreckage of Nazi legions, blasted by Allied air power. That breakthrough at the Melfer River was probably the last major uh, fight that the Germans put up before Rome. We presumed they were going up to find another river and set up another line that we'd have to break again. As it happens, they left. They didn't go to Rome. We didn't know that. Films taken by Italian anti-fascists show the evacuation of Rome, one of the greatest blows of the war to Nazi prestige. The streets were deserted as the Nazis left. We were told to stop. And uh, we sent back a message saying, we're only 26 miles out of Rome and they're running. We can be there in two hours. We were told, you will stop immediately. Do not go any farther. Stop where you are. And we stopped where we were. And we found out later the Americans wanted to take Rome. The Canadians were definitely the ones that broke the Hitler line, which then opened up the road to Rome. No question about it. But within the short distance of bringing Rome, they pulled us back, and the Americans marched in. That was two days before D-Day, by the way. June 4th, 1944. Rome was free, liberated after 21 years of fascist rule. We could never understand it. We were there to liberate it. But politically, the Americans marched in. More citizens turn out to greet the Yanks, as now, in formal order, they pour through the gates into the ancient city. We done all the work and all the, hard, uh, the, the hardships and whatnot, and they took the glory. General Clark enters Rome. Europe's first capital to fall to Allied armies of liberation is now officially occupied. The Roman populace begins to gather in a joyful reception. General Mark Clark, the American, pulled the Canadians out and put the Americans to go into Rome. Oh, we were so furious we'd have killed the Americans faster than the Germans if we got them. But however, Clark, I think he got his comeuppance later, I think even from his, the Americans, because in going into Rome like that and picking up the glory, he allowed a whole German army to, group to escape, and they got up to the... We had to fight them in the Gothic line in August 31st with many more casualties and a lot more, you know, uh, troops killed and wounded and tanks lost and everything like that. And that would, shouldn't have happened if he'd done his job and, and surrounded Rome instead of going into it and, and cut off all those German armies. We looked back what we had accomplished. We had forced the Italian army out of the war altogether. We were containing close to a million Germans, over 900 and some odd thousand Germans. We were containing them in Italy. And if we hadn't done that, both the Italian and the German troops would have been quickly transported up in Northwest Europe and would have made that campaign an even tougher one than it was. And of course, 6th of June, D-Day up in Normandy, and they kind of forgot about us down there in Italy. D-Day, we were kind of uh, forgotten. We were known as the D-Day Dodgers. 
we felt that was a harsh thing for them to say because what calling us the D-Day Dodgers because we had already had 11 months of frontline duty when D-Day occurred yeah. and I, I'm sure the world knew that Italy wasn't a, a cakewalk I've been back to Italy five times, eh? And I have visited one time or another every cemetery that we have friends of mine buried in. How does that feel? It's cathartic in a way because uh, at times I have felt Guilty that I'm alive. And they're dead. Can you understand that? Stay. 